Okay. All right. Uh, good evening and welcome to the uh, March edition of the uh, Poetry Playhouse series. Uh, it's been uh, typical March weather in New Mexico recently. We've uh, had hail, snow, rain, and sun all within the past week. Uh, so anyway, we're looking forward to a warm up. Uh, tonight, uh, uh, Jules and I are quite excited to uh, to present uh, Mary Oishi. And um, Mary was the 2020 to 2022 Poet Laureate of Albuquerque. She's the author of Spirit Birds They Told Me from West End Press and co-author with her daughter Aja of Rock, Paper, Scissors from Swimming with Elephants Press. Her work appears in numerous print and digital publications nationally and internationally including in translation. Uh, uh, Mary has served as an instructor for the University of New Mexico Valencia and the Taos Writers Conference, as well as a poetry mentor for the Kundaman Writers Retreat Program. Uh, Mary Oishi has been an invaluable contributor to the New Mexico poetry community for years. Uh, some of you may remember her reading in our in-person Cactus Brewing series back in 2019, and as part of the Icon Magazine celebratory launch last October. As Albuquerque Poet Laureate during the height of the COVID pandemic, she faced a particular challenge and responded by creating a series of hybrid events involving our local libraries and the residents of their neighborhoods. Uh, one Albuquerque, 100 Poems, the anthology she edited from her Poets in the Library series was released last year. Uh, Mary Oishu will be reading from Sidewalk Cruise Ship, her upcoming collection from the University of New Mexico Press. Please help us welcome Mary Oishu. Thank you so much, John and Jules, uh, for having this great venue for poets. And also to the many friends I see in the Zoom room, which makes me so happy. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I'll start with the three poems that Jules sent out with the, inv the email invitation. And um, all of these are from Sidewalk Cruise Ship, however, they had me submit 100 poems and I'm not absolutely certain that all of them will be in the final book that comes out next year. The first one is a haiku that I wrote on uh, February 23rd, the day before the invasion of Ukraine. Today, not one bird, thin snow caps on everything, the hush before war. Choice. Every birthing mother rides with death for a while, some for a few minutes, some hours, some days, some all the way past the point where they can wrap new life in their arms, leap from his chariot, or even themselves dismount alone. Who dares to force her stay aboard? No matter how child she is, how old, no matter how she got there, father, grandpa, violent stranger, even if it's guaranteed he'll drive her past the veil. Last visit, there was a window. She looked in that direction, but she didn't see. She didn't see the trees at the end of her yard. She didn't see the birds singing in them. She didn't see the pleasant summer sky with the faraway clouds. All she could see was five years of memories, her granddaughter waving, not knowing it was goodbye. As John said, I was the, well, the pandemic was happening the entire time that I, of my uh, poet laureate tenure. So naturally I had to write some poems about it. So I selected two to share with you tonight. Pandemic notice. I notice how stay at home can be house arrest or fortress, depending on my focus. I notice how pets, once amusement and responsibilities, 
became eyes I can look into, not on a screen, but within inches, how they are living warmth I can touch and hold. I notice when somebody else shops for me, they don't care about the amount of green on the bananas or the farthest out expiration date on the cereal. I notice when they hurry away from dropping the bags on my porch, hustling to pay the rent, taking risks for those of us who can't afford to and can afford not to, that I am grateful, green bananas and all. I notice maskless people walking down the sidewalk in front of my house. I notice those who wear their masks over their mouth with their nose exposed. I marvel at how little some understand the purpose of things. I notice songbirds when they're in the tree. I notice when they're gone and it's a worry. I notice with invisible danger lurking who knows where. I want to be told as much truth as anyone knows. The sleuths, the scientists, those who can realistically tell me how to keep myself safe. I have no interest in comfortable lies that could sneak the enemy past my door. I notice that I miss ritual and shared tradition so much. I hung Christmas lights for the first time, sometimes let them burn all day. I notice what I miss the most and what I look forward to are the same. I notice even at my age, I can form new habits. I can adapt, I can learn, I can change. And this one will be in an upcoming anthology that Michelle Otero was one of the editors of. It's the New Mexico Poetry Anthology that is due out this June. It's called Ghost Town. This town is coming like a ghost town, was the song that kept singing in an Albuquerque adopted son's head, louder and too loud for the silence downtown as he walked deserted streets past boarded up windows. He took a few pictures, a truck turning left with no one in the crosswalk or the sidewalks either for that matter, except the son with a song in his head and one unhoused man curled up in his dirty blue blanket in an alcove, his few belongings nearby, a water bottle and a backpack in the corner near his head, already half ghost. One shop owner, windows intact, has painted on them the face of George Floyd. Black Lives Matter, hashtag justice for George Floyd is the caption. It's more of a chant than a song, but yeah, I can see how your inside ears would sing, this town is coming like a ghost town. Another picture on the strip, one lone lowrider, red lights in the grill. A few blocks down, a chopper, all stretched out, yellow, chrome, and attitude. Other than that, not much sign of life. Albuquerque's adopted son is feeling deep despair. I doubt he ever took the Old Town Ghost Tour back when things were open all the time. He wasn't a tourist. This is his home. Who needs a ghost tour? Ghosts in every neighborhood, hand hiding in the volcanoes, ghosts everywhere. In the university ghetto, an alcoholic found three days later in her back room dead. Now she's refusing to leave, leave lighting all the candles, turning on the stereo at 3 a.m. She's determined to get somebody's attention. La Llorona, you'll have to ask the ones born here about her. I can tell you since I arrived, one spirit runs down Zuni looking for an unlocked car to spend the night looking over her shoulders for the one cop who turned off his lapel camera. Friends keep building her memorials by the wall at the trailer park near where she went down before Zuni bends back to central. They keep building over and over, but they keep being torn down until they finally give up. This ghost, not on the old town ghost tour, too far removed. Nor the ghost with the black gloves, Los Guantes Negros, holding a shovel, wishing he had answered his daughter's calls so that no wellness turned death call had followed. Nor is the ghost on a hill near the manicured neighbors just under the mountain, the ones with the magnificent westward views. He wasn't well, he wasn't to be reasoned with, he didn't belong there. 
So the cops were called. This town is coming like a ghost town. Yes, it's a ghost town. Spirits that go back more than 300 years, long before this country ever breathed its name. Didn't you see that sign on your last picture? It says, some tears become flames. Don't despair, son. That's Albuquerque talking. And she damn well knows what she's talking about. This is another narrative poem. Uh, I think, well, I wrote a lot of tanka and haiku in the last year or so, but for some reason I picked the long ones tonight. A place for sorrow. When my friend Jo goes out, she puts her sorrow in a kitchen drawer between the vegetable peeler and the spatulas, covers it with a bright red hot pad to keep it warm and comforted while she's away. Don't worry, she tells her sorrow. I'll be back to keep you company, but I can't take you with me out into the world, not out there. I've got volunteer work to do, political causes, research at the university. While she's gone, she won't think back all those years to the night the police officer shows up at her door at midnight. She knows him, Sean. He's in her night class at the university. She's happy to see him. They don't get much company these days at any hour. Her son is never in trouble, such a good boy. She knows this must be a friendly visit while Sean is on patrol. She invites him into the living room. Is your husband here, he asks. Oh, such a gentleman, she thinks. Can you get him? Oh, he really wants to meet Bill, okay. Drunk driver, so sorry, your son, gone, gone, gone. That's what Sean comes to say at midnight, but, but he just graduated college, his fiance, such a lovely girl. She asks expressionless, do you want a cup of tea? Now from the kitchen drawer, her sorrow beckons, but she gently reassures it on her way out the door. I won't leave you very long. Her psychiatrist friend says, why don't you flush it down the commode? Oh no, she says, then it might go bother someone else and this is my sorrow. I've got shoulders to carry it and I've got the perfect place to keep it while I'm gone. Joe rarely leaves the house now that she's a fourscore widow. That old sorrow is getting more insistent every day. So she invites others in for tea and conversation and speaks of healthcare policy, of obscure history from her native Spain, of today's headlines, two police officers gunned down in the line of duty, of Gloria Steinem's refrigerator sparse with only scotch and ice cream, of her late husband's woodcuts, done in Taos where light is grand, of her poor proud students who would never think of buying day old bread, of Greenwich Village back when you could walk at night, of happier days when her son made that sugar bowl from two small jars. She, calls the, she recalls the hippies with a smile, groove on it, that's what they used to say. And all the while her old companion drapes her shoulders brooding, brooding straight at you, and you can never quite spend time with Joe alone. So I'm getting up there <laughs> in years, and um, I've been writing a little bit about aging. So I'll read a few, uh, well, I'll just read one and then some things I learned in aging. Say it isn't so. My daughter is 40 now. Just week before last, she was 18 and traveling. Week after next, she'll be me. Disillusions. I met you before, I know I did, or, I, or was I dreaming? Perfect harmony and song is not the same as by the breakfast nook. It was not the song that made me remember love, it was the static. I saw lightning where there was no lightning, love where there was no love. Love is a great drug, but the hangover has a mortality rate. I guess you can tell one of the things that I've come to the conclusion of in my years. 
The other thing is that I need to take care of myself. So this is called self-care. Tried to think of a way to save it. Maybe I could remove the clear plastic, clean underneath, but no. Mold was embedded in the dust jacket. Even if I could clean it outside, moisture, mold made the pages wavy brown, pungent, a sacrilege of black and white illustrations, photographs distorted. How to arrange flowers written by a Japanese expert. I was certain I could learn something, some mystical aesthetic principle, principle that would delight me like new tea. But my throat was starting to seize, just like in that sick building. Sudden, swift decision. Step on the toe release, up the trash lid, in the book. Disease and intrigue tied up quickly with empty olive jar, dog food bag, wadded up paper towels, dryer lint. Even Ikebana corrupted gets sent to the curb. Life too delicate to save any more carriers. Now I determined when I was compiling the poems for this manuscript, I was determined that it not get so intensely political, but I couldn't help myself because I'm a political animal. So <laughs> I have to read a few of those too. Um, in case you don't know, Wanda Co Cooper Jones is the mother of Ahmad Arbery, the one who got chased down by three white men and killed. So this is for Wanda Cooper Jones. Mother who never wanted this mountain to climb holds the scene of him first time in her arms and climbs until Merrick Garland cries. This one I've never read before to anyone. It's called Himicane. I was born in a century when all hurricanes were given women's names, when death and destruction were attributed to women in succeeding letters of the alphabet, Hurricane Agnes, Hurricane Betty, Hurricane Carmen, Hurricane Dawn, Hurricane Ella, each standing in for treacherous Eve, destroying the peaceful garden. Yet in the century of my delivery, at least a billion women gave birth while men started two world wars, a whirlwind of regional wars after. Hurricane Hitler, Hurricane Mao, Hurricane McNamara, Hurricane Pol Pot, Hurricane Stalin, and countless lesser storms killed women and children in their millions. Yes, there have been damaged women, treacherous women, but mostly we give life. The first mother, still in our DNA, is immortal. Though we have been forced to carry the father's 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 name ad infinitum, our sons, Mr. So-and-so Jr. and the third, war is menstruation envy, my old button used to say, but so was shutting women out of architecture and art, so complete a hoarding of all other forms of immortality that in my century, women took a man's name to sneak past the guards, the editors, and get published or let their husbands sign their work so he would, could be okay with his wombless life. Then he turns around and calls her death, points to Kali. Oh, my ancient ovaries churn, they do, but they stir future generations, not devastation. Eight million horses. Eight million horses died in World War I. One Christmas in that war in the holiday spirit with carols wafting back and forth, British, Belgian, French, and German soldiers in their trenches, homesick, overcome by their common humanity, called a spontaneous ceasefire, soldier to soldier, came out of the trenches, exchanged gifts, played games, celebrated together in the land between. Word eventually got out. Higher ups couldn't have that, can't wage war with soldiers who won't kill, soldiers who make enemies friends. British command forced the breaking of the Christmas truce, ordered them to betray and fired. Still, this pause of peace happened amid brutality, chemical warfare, and eight million horse, bur eight million horse bloodbath. Two times that many human casualties, military and civilian, World War I was unthinkable. The war to end all wars, they called it. 
Yet there came World War II, so many wars since, so many millions more, bloody, bruised, burned alive. Still no world peace, not yet. But it is thinkable. If we can again remember, shake hands in no man's land when we hear the music call. Okay, I had to, I had to include this because my, my laureateship did did start during the uh, Trump administration. Red bus. Ignorance strapped us in like crash test dummies, fast headed for a wall. She's on the passenger side having just ripped up roses with her, I don't care to you. He's in the driver's seat oogling women as we speed by, tossing back paper towels and bleach. We're mostly in the back seats petrified. Some cheering faster, faster, go, go. Some clearly sleeping through it all. Now, I always like to end with uh, hope. <laughs> Just because, well, without hope, you know. This is going to be in an upcoming anthology that should be out later this year called Open Hearted Horizon, Albuquerque, an Albuquerque poetry anthology. It will be there under a different name, Prophecy on an Albuquerque Day, but for the sake of sidewalk cruise ship, I just called it Prophecy. A Diné poet, mother, multimedia artist told me today that according to the indigenous calendar, we're about to leave what she calls hell cycles, enter the cycle she and her people call heaven when the Pleiades is directly overhead. It will get worse before it gets better, but by 2038, the mixed people, and look at us, we're all mixed. The mixed people will take us back to living with the earth again. So says the prophecy, she said, smiling down at her boy. So says the prophecy, rebeats my weary heart, weary of the cycles of pandemic hell, of conspiracy hell, of mass shootings hell, of history erasing hell, hell after hell, but so says the prophecy. So says the prophecy carries like a refrain, glowing, warming my winter heart, waiting for the mixed grandchild who will bring heaven to earth for me this year, no matter where the Pleiades appears on the night of her birth. Perhaps she will help take us back. Perhaps by 2038, she and all the mixed peoples of earth will usher in the heaven cycles. At least so says the prophecy. Who am I to disbelieve? Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, you may unmute and give Mary a round of applause. Yeah. Hey, Mary. Thank hey, you, Mary. Love Mary. you. Love Mary. you. Mary. Incredible. Thank you so much. Raising my glass to you, Mary. Mary. Great job. Thank you. Bring it on. And yeah. You don't look a day over 40. <laughs> ah. <laughs> you look beautiful tonight. Yeah, Absolutely. lovely, lovely. Uh, thank you, Mary. Well, so we're going to spend a few minutes uh, chatting with Mary before we turn to the open mic. And um, uh, so um, I was wondering if you could just uh, tell us a little bit more about what you, you know, what you learned doing the Poet Laureate uh, in that, uh, in the time of cholera, right? And, uh, and, uh, and what, uh, and uh, and what what you accomplished during that period as well, yeah. Well, I I had an idea to uh, because I know that there are so many wonderful poets in Albuquerque. It's just a poetry town. It has been from the time I arrived. I was delighted to find out what a great poetry town it is, and um, so I wanted to. Uh, use it to use my my time in that position to really showcase the the wonderful amount of poets and the caliber of poets that we have here. And I thought I knew all the poets, but I didn't even know close to all the poets because um, I I got together with the person in charge of the uh, of the community relations for the libraries. We have 
19, I think now 20 libraries in Albuquerque. And so um, I just, I invited the, what, what I did because the libraries closed after I devised this whole thing, I was going to have the local poets from that library come in, have a featured reader and then have, you know, other people who live around that library to come in and do an open mic. And then the library's closed. So it was like, okay, what do we do now? <laughs> so I had the featured readers come and read outside the library and were videoed. And then someone from the library talked a little bit about what was available at that library. And there's all kinds of great things, including like a seed program at the South Broadway a library. But, um, and then I had Zoom readings for all the other, so it was a bit like herding cats to try to get everybody, yeah, but right. it really, it really turned out to be a beautiful series and it's preserved on the Albuquerque City YouTube channel and on the library's websites. And it's just really turned out to be like an archive of the pandemic. And then we produced uh, a, an anthology of written work from uh, 100 different poets. And that didn't even include all the poets. But it's just, you know, that's called One Albuquerque, 100 Poems. And I was fortunate enough to solicit the poems and edit and, and put it together. So it's just, it was, it was, it turned out to be a great experience despite the obstacles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the, the video series, the terrific series, uh, maybe, um, uh, maybe Jules could put the link, the link to that uh, when she sends uh, uh, the announcement about this recording to to the playhouse list so yeah. yeah it's on the one i think it's called one albuquerque youtube channel yeah and just look up yeah yeah there's a whole bunch of videos there cool yeah and uh and you know we also do have uh uh all of our previous uh, Zoom readings for the past three years uh, on the Jules Nyquist YouTube channel. So there's a lot of great poetry there. Art is trying to say something, but he's muted. Were you saying um, something? Well, okay. Yeah, we're having tight. Uh, no, no, I'm fine. Oh, you're chat. good. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, so so uh, anyway, uh, so Jules, did you have, did you have a question for Mary or? Uh, hold on here. So yeah, um, and if you have a question, please type it in the chat because we will read those off just to try to keep it a little organized. And Mary, thanks for a wonderful reading. And um, I remember you read at the Icon uh, magazine, the feminist magazine reading as well. And your poems are, I love that you mentioned Gloria Steinem in one of your poems. She's one of my favorites. I think she had her birthday this year or this week or um and she's in her late 80s i believe um and and sometimes i've talked to the younger generation and they don't know who she is so i think it's really important to preserve that um so talk more about just and and i love you that you have politics in your poem i always think poetry is political um do you want to talk more anything about uh politics and you know and poetry and, and where you get that well, I think, you know, I think that it's incumbent on poets to be the truth tellers. And there's so much deception now and misinformation and, and propaganda that we have an even more crucial role to play in, in bringing the truth forward. And, uh, you know, so even though I tried to not, because I know like, you know, well, if you're a slam poet or a performance poet, you're allowed to be political, but if you're, uh, you know, a literary poet, you're not allowed. And I'm just like, well, whatever. You know, who came up with that? Right? I don't know. Who came up with that? The people who don't division. want us to reveal the truth, I guess. I don't yeah. know. Um, but I think it's really right. critical. Yeah. Right. And I like, thank you for saying that, that we're the two tellers and all poetry can be political in a way. I mean, um, and then, oh, I wanted to mention, you know, so your new book is called Sidewalk Cruise Strip. Um, mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about that and when it uh, will be published? 
Yeah, uh, UNM Press is putting out one book for each Poet Laureate of Albuquerque. And so I'm part of that Poet Laureate series. And um, the, it'll be out next year. It was supposed to be out this year, but there was a, you know, a, a, a hitch with the poetry editor there where she had to take several months off. So, um, so they pushed it back to sometime next year, probably early next year. And um, sidewalk cruise ship means um, it, 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 the, the poem that I based, that I took that title from is about a, a person finding an abandoned sofa, a, an unhoused person, and just how much it meant to her. I think a lot of times when I drive around the city, I just see things and it's almost like my spirit, like that person kind of comes into my I just you know, can't help but write what feels like is their story. You know? I just saw this woman collapse into this big sofa that was out <laughs> on the street. And I was like, oh my God, it's like a cruise ship to her. <laughs> you know? I had a real love of Albuquerque that shows. Oh yeah, um, Ghost Town, Albuquerque. And <laughs> yeah. I mean, you, you have the character of Albuquerque there. Yeah. Anything um, you want? Uh, uh, oh, I just want to, since Mary just mentioned the the poet laureate poets laureate series that UNM Press is is doing, I wanted to mention this weekend at Bookworks there's a reading by all the uh, present and past uh, Albuquerque poets laureate. And remember what time that is? April first, Saturday, six o'clock. Six p.m. So if you're gonna get there, get there early because it's. There aren't going to be, it's going to fill up. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's not all of us. It's uh, Michelle Otero and uh, Hakeem Bellamy and, and I. So, oh, okay. And, and maybe Ana Martinez. Okay. And then, um, and then the former and current New Mexico Poets Laureate, uh, which would be Levi Romero and um, uh, Lauren Camp. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So that should be really exciting. Quite a, a wonderful collection of poets. So yeah, yeah. Um, it's exciting. <laughs> I, I guess I'll ask one other question and then I'll get to some of them in the chat here. But, and I, I think John touched on it a little bit. What was, what did you bring out of the Poet Laureate experience? Anything you want to share on how that affected you? Um, in your writing or as a poet? <clears throat> well, you know, I it was unexpected um, because I was nominated by somebody else. So I, you know, I didn't really, it wasn't even on my radar. And um, when I got the, the email that I was nominated, I was like, oh my gosh, really? And then they sent me, you know, all these questions I had to give written answers to. And I had to, I had to submit a huge packet of paperwork. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I thought, well, you know, I'm retired now, so why not? You know, <laughs> so I put it together and sent it in, and I really didn't expect, you know, to get it. But but when I when I got it, I was I was so like amazed and and thrilled. But I I also know that like we have so many poets in this town who could be poets laureate that like we could have had a new one every month <laughs> that we would not run out. So I really wanted to bring a lot of poets into the experience as much as possible and just honor um, what we have here, which I think is a treasure. I mean, I've never lived anywhere where poetry was this important and poets were this respected. So it really felt like a huge, huge honor uh, to be chosen and, and yeah. So, and, and, and it's opened up many doors for me, you know, I've been, I've been able to do so many things that I never uh, was invited to do before. <laughs> so that's nice. I see, uh, I see Martha Deed uh, from Buffalo in the audience here. Hi, Martha. That may, Buffalo may be the only other town besides Albuquerque that has so many poets, you know, where it's like almost every other person is a poet, it seems like. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. Shout out to Buffalo. <laughs> Maybe they're snowed in all the time. Yeah. <laughs> they have to write poetry. Yeah. Well, that there's that. <laughs> yeah. You I don't saw someone... need a 
What's that? You don't need a pandemic to be kept inside. Right. You don't need a <laughs> pandemic to be kept inside in Buffalo, right? <laughs> uh, do we have time hey, for I, Yeah, I've got a, a couple of questions here. Oh, One is um, I'm from the chat. So any, what are your uh, poetry influences? Yeah, um, my early influences were, you know, kind of the classic poets that I we read in, you know, in school, uh, you know, like Emily Dickinson and Edna St. Vincent Millay and uh, E.E. E. Cummings and Carl Sandburg and all the, you know, those people. Um, but after, you know, after I became an adult, I think the biggest influences on me were people like Janice Nirikitani, who was the poet laureate of San Francisco. And, um, you know, when I would get rejections, I would say, you know, I, I started getting discouraged when I was younger, you know, and then I read her, you know, her work and I said, oh, I am a poet. I'm just a Japanese American poet. <laughs> and so, you know, I did get to know her too. And she even wrote an endorsement for the book that I did with my daughter. So, um, yeah, unfortunately, she passed away not too long ago. And, um, but she was a big influence on me and, you know, other, you know, other poets who, I mean, I'm constantly influenced by other poets, you know, I, that's why I go to a lot of poetry readings because it just, you know, feeds me, it nourishes me. I went to hear the former poet laureate of the United States, uh, Juan Felipe Herrera mm -hmm. at the Lenzic in Santa Fe. And I was so inspired that if I hadn't gone with somebody and promised to go to dinner afterwards, <laughs> I would have gone right out to my car and just wrote poetry just because, you know, he's so, he was so inspiring. What an amazing, <laughs> humble man and just incredible. Yeah. yeah. And you also um, have, do the blues in your radio. Um, tell us, are you what? What? Where are you broadcasting now? Are you? I actually took a break from that because I have so many writing projects. I have a memoir that I'm trying to revise and get to somewhere, <laughs> either an agent or a publisher. And so I worked on that for over 10 years. So I, I need to finish it and get it out there. And- um, You were on KUNM for a number of years and then you switched yes. to the Santa Fe Public Radio. I've right? actually been on, um, I've done a blues show on five different radio stations. <laughs> yeah. I started at KVNF in Peonia, Colorado. I was on KUNM, I was on KSFR pretty recently. And then I produced a show for um, uh, KGLP in Gallup, New Mexico. And I was asked to do one for a station in Northern California, but I'm just, you know, yeah, I, I need to take a break because I'm a new grandmother and that's part of what's taking up some time. And also because I do wanna get some of these writing projects finished. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's good. Well, be best wishes with your memoir. That's always Thank exciting you. and more poetry. Anything else you want to say to wrap up or um, events you're doing or anything that way? Uh, no, just if you want, if you want the books that I have out now, the two that I have out now, which I didn't read from tonight, um, they're available in Albuquerque and Santa Fe at local bookstores. And then also um through amazon but they only have used ones at this point i guess i need to find out about a second printing but um but you can get i still have a few copies myself so you can email me at poetoishi at yahoo.com and um, i can set it up with you to get a new copy of either one or an autograph too yeah. so and also the uh, bookshop link, I, a lot of, you can do your local bookstore and request books and they can try to order too. And then money goes back to the local bookstore, unlike Amazon. Yes. Uh, well, thank you so much. Anything else, John, that you want to thank add? Thank you. Oh, just, I want just to have us unmute again and, and give Mary <laughs> another cool. round of applause. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you again. Yeah. Wonderful. Blessings. Thank you, Mary. Great. Beautiful.